Basking in the sun reflecting off the waters of Sarasota Bay, Florida, rests the legacy of the circus king, John Ringling. The John and Mabel Ringling Museum of Art. The grade school educated showman dreamed that his adopted city would become a center of culture, education, and the arts. To accomplish his goal, he built a Venetian-style palace for his home and an Italian Renaissance villa for an art museum. John Ringling went on to build a collection of old masterworks that ultimately included more than 600 paintings and many more examples of the decorative arts. He acquired most of his collection within the short span of five years. President Calvin Coolidge and the First Lady spent a day at the circus to watch the world's greatest show with their host, John Ringling. Each spring, railroad cars filled with exotic animals and circus paraphernalia pulled into town as the bandwagon heralded the arrival of the circus. 14,000 men, women, and children crowded under the big top for the Ringling Brothers' Barnum and Bailey Circus. Presiding was John Ringling, the last surviving brother of America's premier circus family. The son of a German harness maker, John and four of his brothers formed a small circus troupe in 1884. By 1890, they had expanded, taking advantage of the railroads to travel greater distances, reaching larger audiences. In 1907, the brothers bought out their prime competitor, the Barnum and Bailey Circus, recouping their entire investment of $410,000 in one season, making them the largest circus organization in America. John was the advance man, deciding which towns would provide the most profit, negotiating contracts, and arranging railroad schedules. Standing six foot one and weighing over 200 pounds, John was an impressive figure. He seemed to have an aura of power. Not just a big man, but a, a man who exudes strength and a reserve of power. And in addition to that, a very fairly soft, low voice. But being internationally recognized as part of the circus family was not enough for John. Because he wasn't satisfied merely to be a great circus man. He had other interests and he was determined to pursue them. John invested in railroads, ranches, banks, and oil fields. He was associated with 35 different companies during his lifetime, realizing his dream to be a businessman and capitalist. By the roaring 20s, the circus was thriving and the Oklahoma oil fields producing liquid gold. Those are still pumping oil. And the income from that probably exceeded his circus money. So he was getting close to a million a year uh, in the early 20s. And that today would be at least 10 million a year. Ringling was 39 when he met Mabel Burton. Little is known about her Ohio farm childhood or their first meeting but she was beautiful, poised, and warm. She was 30 when they married in Hoboken, New Jersey. It's generally believed that Mabel could have anything in this world that she wished. She had only to say so, and John would instantly fulfill that wish. And I think that was the kind of marriage that they had. She was a lovable person, and not one to be walked over either. And so they made an ideal couple. During the circus season, John and Mabel lived in New York apartments or their private rail car. In the summer, they toured Europe, frequently visiting Italy. Earlier, when the circus came to Tampa, they visited friends and traveled along the coast of Florida in their private yacht. It was in 1909 that they first came to the small Gulf Shore town of Sarasota, Florida. At the time the Ringlings came, it was a small place. It was a place relatively unconnected by any kind of sophisticated transportation to the rest of the world. There were a few cars. Reportedly, uh, they had to navigate the sandy, deep ruts of the roads there were. One developer bragged that his car could climb pine trees as well as the rutted roads. And it was that kind of a setting. The Ringlings chose Sarasota as their winter home. 
buying a frame house and 20 acres on Shell Beach. Almost a decade later, John began investing in land, concentrating on the barrier islands in Sarasota Bay. His first purchase was the old Sarasota Yacht and Automobile Club and lots on Cedar Point, later called Golden Gate Point. He then bought the Island Keys, Bird, St. Armand's, and Lido, and portions of Longboat Key. The dreamer envisioned a unique upscale coastal community. To enhance the vision, John and Mabel built an elaborate winter home overlooking Sarasota Bay. The architectural wonder was designed after the great Venetian palazzos, and they named it Cadizan, which in Venetian dialect means House of John. The 30-room seaside palace was a model showplace for potential real estate buyers eager to take part in the Florida land boom. Florida land was advertised everywhere, and the fact that it would make you a millionaire if you would start investing and selling Florida land. Millionaire, a millionaire could be made in a year, or overnight, whatever. Uh, it, there were marquees uh, in New York City. Uh, Will Rogers mentioned it in his jokes. It was everywhere. Go to Florida and become a millionaire. And that's what fueled the entire thing. The Florida land boom was in full swing by 1925. Ringling Isles was planned, a causeway connecting to St. Armand's Key was under construction, and John was ready for his next venture, an exclusive Ritz-Carlton Hotel on Longboat Key. To decorate the hotel, John traveled to Naples, Italy, to the famous Curazzi Foundry. There he ordered several statues, including a bronze replica of Michelangelo's David. He was accompanied by Munich art dealer Julius Bowler. During the trip, John told Julius that he and Mabel had decided to found an art museum. The idea of the museum was to make Sarasota a cultural and because there was to be an art school, an educational center within Florida and give it that extra special quality. Um, I think that was a primary reason he began building the museum and collecting art. Um, I think he also had in mind to memorialize himself by building this museum and naming after himself and Mabel, and they were originally meant to be buried under the statue of David within the museum. I think was also the right civic gesture to make, but ultimately I think was a business proposition. But as often happens to people who start out doing something for one reason, he got hooked. And at the end of his five years of intense collecting in 29, 30, he really had developed an eye. He'd become a connoisseur and a very serious collector. To house the collection, Ringling planned a grand Tuscan villa on Sarasota Bay to be designed by architect John H. Phillips. As Phillips drafted blueprints, Ringling began studying the world of art. He had dabbled in buying art for almost 20 years, but now the entrepreneur capitalist was embarking on a new adventure, learning to be an art connoisseur. John began his self-education by surrounding himself with art books and journals, absorbing knowledge from his impressive library. He studied auction catalogs, tracking the sale and purchase of master works, learning the art market by keeping notes of what was sold and who bought it. Ringling soon traveled in the elite circle of art experts. Among them was Julius Bowler, affectionately called Lulu by friends and family. Well, first here we were talking about a world-class collector and dealer. His clients were numbered among the great galleries and the most important collectors, in, not only in Europe, but in America as well. Uh, and he was a man who was so widely respected that this is the kind of person John would be attracted to, someone who was an authority, uh, whose judgment could be trusted, and as a person, a man who clearly uh, was honest and dependable. The art dealer became Ringling's mentor, confidant, and curator. Their correspondence shows it was a rare friendship for Ringling. They became more than just uh, selling and buying friends. And you notice that their letters are always signed love. That's a pretty strong word. Together they made a tremendous team. In 1925, Bowler began acquiring masterworks specifically for the museum. Rest on the Flight from Egypt by Paolo Veronese.
and the Madonna enthroned with child between St. Sebastian and St. Roque by Bernardino Luini. Ringling went on to build a collection that ultimately included more than 600 paintings and many more examples of the decorative arts, most acquired within the short span of five years. John concentrated on collecting works by 17th century Baroque artists, known for their mastery of light and shade to achieve maximum emotional impact. Nearly one half of his museum collection are works of Italian Baroque painters. Ringling is a circus man, and Baroque art is um, um, art of the 17th century that is, is very interested in the visual impact, the emotional impact art can make. So um, it's a natural affiliation, you think. But I think more practically, John could buy big, important Baroque paintings for his big museum at a much more reasonable price than he could buy Italian Renaissance primitives. So he was buying something in which there was less interest, but that perhaps also matched his, his interest in, in the visual impact of things. Ringling's timing coincided with a shift in the fortunes of European aristocrats, forced to empty their ancestral homes of Baroque and Renaissance paintings. Many of these came on the market in the 1920s um, because English country houses were either shutting down or collections were being sold to pay inheritance and, and um, um, income tax. Um, and also, there wasn't the kind of competition John might have faced in the 1890s for American collectors seeking to fill their big houses in Newport, Rhode Island, or in New York City. They were downsizing as well. So he was able to buy extraordinary paintings, for instance, a, a, I think the finest painting by Guercino, an Italian Baroque painter in the United States, for $56, who worth more today, uh, but it was an extraordinary deal. One estate sale purchase became the centerpiece of his collection and museum, four paintings by the virtuoso of Flemish Baroque, the artist Peter Paul Rubens. Called cartoons because they were preliminary designs for tapestries, they are actually immense detailed paintings. They had belonged to the Westminster Collection at Grosvenor House, and uh, that was closed, and they went on the market in 1924 before John began buying, but they didn't meet their reserve price at auction, so they're being held by a dealer. When John began buying seriously in 25, 26, the first thing he naturally did was to look for paintings with pedigree, and he came upon the, the Westminster Tapestry cartoons and could, by buying them, instantly buy important paintings, both because they've been made by Peter Paul Rubens, but also because they belong to such a prestigious collection. With the Rubens cartoons as the foundation of the museum, Ringling continued his buying spree. His favorite shopping spot was the auction house. Fair warning at three million six. You'll be the frank three million six hundred thousand. One landmark auction was the Holford sale at Christie's in London in 1927 and 1928. Bowler excitedly wrote to John, it is the Holford collection that is going to be sold. This is very important, a very rare occasion. The marked catalogs indicate Ringling was seeking 51 works, nearly half of the total Italian paintings offered. The Holford sale included two portraits of the Queen of Cyprus, then believed to be by Titian. Ringling's catalog was marked to bid up to $12,000 for one. He ultimately paid more than $16,000 for the piece, making it the most expensive acquired by Ringling at the sale. The work was later declared to be by the studio of Titian. He really wanted a Titian, and sadly, all the Titians he bought aren't. He wanted a Rembrandt, desperately wanted a Rembrandt. He bought a very fine deposition or lamentation um, over the body of Christ. It isn't a Rembrandt, but it's a great painting, and I think he should have been proud of that purchase. One treasure he acquired at the second Holford auction was a Velazquez portrait of Philip IV of Spain, which reflects the physical personality of the young king. The portrait was just one of several Ringling collected. The painting of Peter Jacobs Olicon is one of the finer single portraits by Dutch artist Frans Hals, renowned for his ability to capture the personality of his subjects. For this masterpiece, Ringling paid $100,000. Why pay so much for a portrait? Um, 
Ringling like his contemporaries, and Americans going back to the 1890s were fascinated by portraits, and Lord Devine, a major London dealer who also had a, obviously a dealership in New York, also fed that interest in portraits. What Americans lacked was an ancestry, or an evident ancestry of the sort you saw in visiting any English country house, and all the portraits going back to the Elizabethan age, all up and down the grand staircases and so forth. So Ringling would pay an exorbitant amount for a single portrait by Franz Hall also bought an extraordinary portrait by Sir Joshua Reynolds, another one by Thomas Gainsborough. So they bought culture, and they bought ancestry, and portraits were a good way to do that. Ringling also liked to buy from the American aristocracy. The Gavay Vanderbilt Belmont collection was an eclectic assortment of medieval and Renaissance paintings, decorative arts, and fine furnishings owned by Alva Vanderbilt Belmont. Included in the collection was Piero di Cosimo's The Building of the Palace. The early 16th century painting would become one of the most important Renaissance paintings in his museum. John was building a massive museum that needed interior decorations. When the Fifth Avenue mansion of New York socialite Caroline Schermerhorn Astor was being demolished in 1926, Ringling bought parts of two rooms and the inter-entrance gateway all of which Phillips incorporated into the museum design. He also bought two paintings that hung in the Astor's ballroom, Detail's The Retreat, and Roy Bay's The Connoisseurs. Through study and experience, John was becoming highly sophisticated in his selections. Though John rarely said anything about his collecting and always contradicted himself, I think, to alarm the press, he did send some telegrams. One evidence of the taste he developed is in this telegram that he writes just after he's visited the Wallace Collection in London. And in this telegram, he compares a version of a particular painting that he sees there with the one he's seen in Munich. And he talks about the spacing of the fingers and the shade of brown and the blue on the dress. So that, for me, is the best evidence that he truly developed an eye that could distinguish color and shape, and he'd also developed a prodigious visual memory in being able to remember things he'd seen and compare them with things he was looking at. That's what a connoisseur does. As John Ringling developed his eye for art, he sometimes made arbitrary, unpopular purchases that would later prove brilliant. When he acquired de Haim's large still life with parrots, it was considered unfashionable. Only very few people in this country want pictures of grub hanging over their sideboards today, sniffed one British dealer. The low prices reflected their unpopularity as most sold for under $400. Today, the De Haim is considered one of the finer examples of Dutch still life painting. But perhaps the art dealer was correct. Ringling also purchased Still Life with Dead Game and a White Swan by the studio of Franz Snyders. It hung in the breakfast room at Ka Design. And the legend, of course, is that John's special friends had their backs to the picture while they ate their meal, and those who were less distinguished uh, had to face it along with their breakfast or lunch, whatever. And it's the kind of thing that John Ringling might enjoy doing. Preparing to open the museum, Ringling expanded the scope of his acquisitions. From the Cypriot collection auctioned by New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art, he purchased sculptures dating from the 8th century BC to the 1st century AD. We have an extraordinary collection of Cypriot antiquities, probably the fourth largest one in the world. and. I think he bought it because he meant the museum to be more comprehensive, but in buying it, he bought a collection of extraordinary significance. Unfortunately for John and Mabel, financial and personal troubles were looming. The Florida land boom was quietly collapsing. In 1927, to boost the local economy, Ringling had moved the entire winter circus quarters from Bridgeport, Connecticut to Sarasota. The amount of people who came to that, both from Florida and from without Florida would be very much like the numbers attracted to Disney today, proportionately. So it made a huge difference. And it was a real economic buffer during the Depression. The museum construction was moving forward, but the weak economy forced Ringling to abandon his Ritz-Carlton hotel venture, leaving an unfinished shell. Italian architectural relics and statues 
were reallocated to the art museum buildings and grounds, but the planned school of art as part of the museum was abandoned. Then, in the spring of 1929, personal tragedy struck. Mabel Ringling died of diabetes and Addison's disease at the age of 54. As far as the personal loss, he just could not accept it. It certainly had the effect of making him more determined than before that he would create a, a really splendid monument and that it had to be of a quality which would achieve uh, national status. And he would do this because he knew that to Mabel this was perhaps the greatest thing in her life. And he was not about to let it falter. Not long after, John sailed to Europe to buy art, although the number of works he purchased after 1930 dropped to a mere handful. Finally, Ringling was able to open the museum. When the museum opened in, officially to the public in 1931, an article in Art Digest said, Ringling Museum, Museum of Architecture. You often forget that visiting museums as you look at the paintings, but the Ringling is extraordinary. As you walk out into the portico, we have columns from a range of different locations throughout Europe. There are fountain enclosures um, all through the walls, architectural detailing. And when you go inside, you see everything from two rooms taken from the Astor Mansion in New York, built in the 1890s and reinserted in this very public space, to details from the Villa del Palmieri, a Renaissance villa in Florence, and doorways from a variety of different 16th century locations. And so it really is a, a, a museum of architecture as well as painting. Despite the triumph of the museum, time was marching against John. Ringling had borrowed almost $2 million in a personal note to buy out his competitors. But his health was failing, and his second marriage ended in bitter divorce. By the summer of 1932, beset by creditors, his assets were pledged as collateral for the circus debt, placing the art collection at risk. In a rare letter, Ringling told Bolor of his troubles, of betrayal by business associates and of hard economic times. But he seemed optimistic that he would be back on his feet physically and financially. He never had the opportunity. John Ringling died at age 70 in New York, six days before Cadizan was to be auctioned. He bequeathed his entire art collection, Cadizan and the museum, to the people of Florida. Today, John Ringling's vision of a cultural center for the arts is a reality. The museum, his home, and his collection of masterworks continue to be a unique cultural resource to the people of Florida, the nation, and the world. If he had not done this, if he had had a, an attractive, elegant little gallery, uh, he would have been a Florida eccentric. And he knew that he had to do more than that if it was going to have a permanent place in the national culture, not just the popular culture of the circus, uh, on a much broader scale. His friends in, in New York, the mayor, Jimmy Walker, and other mayors in New Jersey and the other metropolitan areas said, well, why don't you build this museum in Manhattan? And he decided not to. I think it's interesting to reflect on the fact that if Ringling had built this museum in New York and filled it with the collection that's here, even to this day, it would be um, the finest collection of 16th, 17th, and 18th century Italian, Flemish, and Dutch Baroque painting. Because no other museum in Manhattan um, has the breadth and depth of of collections in the areas um, in which we do. What's extraordinary about John is that his art collecting and his building of a museum are encompassed within a period of five years. And that is something for the son of a harness maker.
is PBS.